Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video on semantic chunking with generative feedback loops. Generative feedback loops are one of our favorite concepts at WeV8 to describe this exchange between large language models, generative AI models, and data, and the data in our database systems, where we take data from the database, feed it into the generative model, and the generative model changes that data or creates new data inspired based on that data and saves this back into the database. So we have this continuous exchange between generative models and databases where the database gives the generative model the context and the generative model outputs new values that we want to save in our database to use later, build upon, and all these kinds of things. So in this application, we start off with an entire code file. We're going to be ingesting the DSPy code base into WeVA by taking the entire code file and splitting it into chunks where each chunk also has a summary of the chunk. So this describes the idea of how we can take this unstructured data, something like an entire blog post, the PDF or code files, particularly in this case, and give it into a generative model that structures it and transforms how the data is saved in the database. So this is one of my favorite applications of just how generative models can improve how we index and structure our data in the databases, but there are all sorts of other applications of generative feedback loops. Say the generative model LLM could take a blog post and write questions that it has based on the blog post, save these questions back into the database, and then it could go from questions to blog posts by connecting itself to web search APIs or Python code interpreters and do research and just you know take the data that's in your database and explore and build more data and extract more insights from your data automatically by putting these LLMs directly in the database through generative feedback loops. So I'm super excited about this application of semantic chunking as well. Chunking has quite a history in vector databases. It's really some topic that comes up all the time. And we have a pretty strong baseline solution of say using 500 token windows and just sliding this through the document, maybe with some kind of rolling overlap and things like this. But I found that this solution doesn't work that well for code files particularly. We don't want to have our 500 token chunk come up at the end in the middle of a function or a class definition. So that's why we're going to use the LLM to take the entire code file, output the chunks and summaries of the chunks, and overall get a cleaner, better vector index, the whole garbage in, garbage out. So we give it clean data to give to our LLMs and do better things as we build, say, RAG, chat with your code bases, or generative feedback loops as we're say summarizing code bases, asking prompts like how would you improve this code base or what features are missing in this code base? By having our data in the database, we can better, you know, weave together <laughs> weave together LLMs and database systems. So I hope this uh, tutorial, I hope you find this interesting. Firstly, I hope that you're able to follow the code in the notebook to get your code into Weave8 and do whatever applications you want to do after that. But I also hope it further builds your interest in generative feedback loops and exploring the applications as we weave together LLMs and database systems. Let's dive into it. This notebook on semantic chunking with generative feedback loops is the newest addition to Weaviate recipes where we contain notebooks or short code snippets, recipes on how to use the different features of Weaviate, as well as our integrations with the broader technology ecosystem and our investigations into the products and the APIs and the different technologies that are being built by this ecosystem. So for example, we have things like exploring NVIDIA's CAGRA vector index on GPUs to see what that looks like and get a sense of how it might relate to Weaviate, as well as maybe more concrete things like if you're using uh, Langchain, Llama index, DSPy, different LLM frameworks, and you want to connect it to Weaviate, and then you want to see what, what can I achieve with these LLM frameworks or say the data connectors like uh, unstructured where you're connecting your say S3 bucket to WeV8 and flowing the data there or Firecrawl getting data from the internet into WeV8, all sorts of things of these integrations as we're exploring the technology ecosystem and trying to make it easier for WeV8 developers to wrap their heads around all the you know change that happens in the AI ecosystem and what's happening. So let's talk about generative feedback loops. So across our different uh, WeV8 features, Generative feedback loops, as well as another uh, service that we're building that's called the recommender service, that's really new, are going to be these services that live alongside WeVA. So we're decoupling these services as functionality from the core database into the service layer that lives around the database. The, so the generative feedback loop, uh, currently we have research notebooks, uh, but we're getting pretty soon to having the production service rolled out. Uh, we've pretty much settled on what the APIs are going to look like for the production service on uh, using this API to trigger updating properties in the database with 
generative models, large language models, as well as creating new objects based on the data. So I'm really excited about fleshing out this section of recipes and refactoring these demos with the production API, which will uh, compress the code. And as we'll see, there's like a huge infrastructure problem underneath running LLMs across your data, which I hope these examples, you know, further help communicate the reason why that you might want to use this service compared to say building this yourself. But let's dive into it. Semantic chunking with generative feedback loops. So this tutorial is going to show you how generative feedback loops are applying large language models onto your database to transform the objects stored in the database can help you with preparing your data for vector search particularly. You can also think about how you might extend these concepts into taking data and say extracting uh, entity relation entity tuples for knowledge graphs or say extracting metadata and structuring it in relational systems generally how you can use llms to take you know an unstructured say messy document like a pdf or just a bunch of emails or just say you just dumped your entire slack thread you just exported all your slack conversations and just uploaded them into weaviate and now you want to add some structure to your database you can put these llms to go through the data in your database and structure it, as we'll see with this example of parsing through code files. So here are some of my favorite uh, resources quickly if you are interested further in generative feedback loops, podcasts with Bob Van Light, uh, notebooks on WeVA recipes, as well as this blog post that I really like is generating blog posts with DSPy. There are four sections to follow along with. Firstly, setting up DSPy, testing the connections to different large language models, so you can use whichever language model you like for this kind of thing. Then showing how we define the generative feedback loop language program with DSPy's typed predictors, and we'll discuss some things around structured outputs. This is a super hot topic in the whole AI field right now, so uh, giving some thoughts and some more explanations on what's happening there. Uh, then we'll see how to load the code repository from disk, so just the DSPy repository, into memory, so just a little helper function thing. And then we'll just loop through doing this where we run the generative feedback loop on our data, importing it into, we importing the chunks and the summaries of the chunks into we get. Okay, so first of all, DSPy setup, uh, pretty standard stuff. You import your API keys, whether you wanna use OpenAI or Anthropic Cloud, Cohere. I forgot to add Google here as well. We can also use a Gemini model. And then say, if you wanna use Llama 3.1, say you wanna start your own VLM server, all sorts of things you can do to connect different LLMs to DSPy. Uh, so then you just go through and test the connection. Something I think is funny is to ask it, uh, please say something interesting about database systems intended to impress me with your intelligence. And that just makes me laugh about getting a quick sense of the different models. Like when you're mixing uh, large models with small models and you wanna see, like have a little sense of what's the difference gonna be when I'm using 8 billion parameter models with say 400 billion parameter models. This just makes me laugh and gives me a quick sense of what, where all the models are at. Okay, so now let's get into the DSPy chunking program. So the first thing to note probably is, let's actually start with the prompt and then come back to the structured outputs thing. So the prompt is gonna be the description of the task. So you have to describe to the language model the task of chunking documents. So this is the whole idea of prompt engineering, automated prompt engineering, is taking off some of the effort of you having to write these prompts. So in this particular case, I have the prompt, your task is to divide a long document into coherent semantic chunks of text. Each chunk should represent a complete thought or topic, typically ranging from one to three paragraphs in length. Follow these guidelines and then a list one to seven, um, some advice on how to do, how to chunk documents. So this would be one of the ideas of DSPy is helping you optimize this prompt because there's some, there's some language that's gonna result in better chunking of documents than others. So that's one idea of the prompting. But now let's get into structured outputs. This is OpenAI has just released a new structured output API, and there's a lot of exciting things we can think about now that we can structure the outputs of large language models. So first of all, the why, what, what does this mean? What it means is they're only going to decode this JSON from the tokens of the large language model. So it's only possible, the large language model, when it output, it predicts the next token in the sequence and it just goes on predicting the next token. And because they've constrained the JSON generation by how they're sampling the tokens, it will only generate JSON. And this means that you can validate it, you can extract certain keys, and you can have it generate more than one thing or structure its outputs. So in this case, what we're doing is we're giving it the entire code file and we're structuring its output to be a list of chunk with summary where each of the objects in this list has the key chunk with a string valued you know, chunk and then a summary with string valued summary. So this is one thing you can do with structuring these outputs. And there's all sorts of interesting research on 
how we achieve this. There is a paper called Let Me Speak, which is the best titled paper ever, which is about how uh, this JSON decoding might be limiting the language models and it might not make them as smart because you're throwing off the distribution of the tokens and say like beam search is different now when you're constraining it to only output JSON. So there's a lot of interesting work around uh, exactly what structured output is going to look like, say whether structured decoding slows down generation is something that I think is very interesting. And an experiment that I've run is uh, using these prompt optimization methods like OPRO, MIPRO to optimize the prompts. So optimizing this language to have it only output JSON. And I found that that also works in addition to explicitly decoding from the JSON. So I think this is a super interesting area and you can imagine really complex structured outputs. And it also probably adds to the argument of how much you can get out of one call to the large language model. A lot of this kind of chaining compound AI system stuff is about, it's sort of limited in one call. So you set, stack together several calls, but as we see structured outputs and the continued advancement of that, as well as the general capability of language models, I think we're gonna get more out of one call to the language model going forward. So then we interface the structured output of a list of the chunk with summary object with DSPy's typed predictors. So DSPy type predictors is gonna interface this as a JSON uh, prompt that you add, and then you have the Pydantic validation and some retry logic if it fails. So this is one approach to achieving structured outputs. Also in DSPy, there's the DSPy assertions approach, which lets you be a little more uh, hands-on about how you're gonna do the retry. And then also you could separate these into two components where the structured output generation or just the whole thing is one task and the retrying is another uh, DSPy module with signature and with a prompt that you can optimize for the retrying. So there's a lot of emerging research. And then of course, also there's the argument of just put, put the structured decoding into the LLM API. So you don't even need to bother with the idea of retrying because there's no way it's gonna fail, but that might slow it down and that might limit the expressiveness of the language model. So a lot of interesting things and we're definitely gonna be <laughs> keeping our eye on this at Weaviate, so you know, we'll let you know what we find. <laughs> Anyways, all right, so now we'll load the code repository into memory. So this is pretty standard stuff, just, you know, ChatGPT can just write this if you ask it to, and ChatGPT did write this. If you just ask it, hey, I have a bunch of folders, I need to load them into memory, super easy for ChatGPT to do. Okay, so this is just going through the DSPy code repository, so just, I got a laugh out of seeing all the files. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny to see, and yeah, so, so, we're just loading all the code from DSPy, all the documentation from the DSPy uh, docs folder, everything but obviously like the JavaScript stuff, and, and I think it's Docusaurus, that, that that awesome stuff, But so not loading that into memory, but just the markdown files are being loaded into memory. Okay, so we load through, loop through and load all the files. We have 105 code files in DSPy slash DSPy, 57 in DSPy slash DSP, dependency of DSPy, and then 103 files in uh, the documentation. All right, so now let's take a quick look at semantic chunking, what the party is all about, and what I guess we're maybe, I don't know how long this video is so far, but say 12 minutes without seeing an example of it. But anyways, <laughs> so let's chunk and summarize the code in DSPy's Weaviate RM. So this is the Python code of how we've added Weaviate to DSPy, what the Weaviate DSPy Python integration looks like is uh, DSPy has these RMs, retrieval models that you connect to settings. And then when you need to retrieve, you just have DSPy.retrieve or, or you could just access the Weaviate RM directly. But anyway, so, so we connect it to the Weaviate client and then within the Weaviate client in the forward pass, you pass in the query or queries and then we you know grab the client, we use our uh, query syntax. If it's the V3 client, we use this one or if it's V4, uh, we use the uh, uh, the query hybrid syntax anyways. So now, so now what we do is we pass this into the DSPy program and we get the chunks of summaries. We see it takes this first per part, it chunks this out. It says this section includes the necessary imports for the module, including handling the optional import of the Weaviate 8 library. So all, we have the optional dependency documented, then chunk one, this chunk introduces the Weaviate 8 RM class, a retrieval module that uses Weaviate 8 to return top passages for a given query. Okay, so anyway, so hopefully you're seeing that it's trying to break up the code file into semantic regions, and then it's providing a natural language summary of what the region is about, what it does, and that can be helpful. So it depends, I'm really not sure what the state of this is yet. You have the Voyage Code 2 models that are, we are using in this example to embed the code, but I just highly think that having a text description of the code is gonna result in a better vector embedding because it's more in distribution of how these text embedding models are trained. So I think it's really useful for the sake of retrieval, as well as the human interpretability nature of it to have this text description of the chunk as well. 
Okay, so now we just uh, run the thing of chunking and importing. So now that we have our chunking program, let's run it and let's import our data into Weaviate. So the first thing we do is define two collections in Weaviate. We have the code collection and the documentation collection. So I'm so excited about this multi-index idea with Weaviate generally using the agent interface to query it, but let's focus now on the importing part. So within code, we define the schema, both the cases where we have the content and the chunk summary. We're gonna be embedding the code chunks with the Voyage Code 2 embedding model, and we're gonna be embedding the natural language documentation with the Cohere uh, Embed English V3.0 model. So already I think it's really fascinating how uh, Voyage emphasizes, hey, we have a code model. They also do this, you know, sort of like if you're just following sort of the market of embedding models and how they're positioning themselves, Voyage says, hey, we have code models, we have particular domains like legal text, and then Cohere, they they go for kind of the all cases use this as well as particularly the multilingual aspect. So I think it's pretty interesting how these embedding providers differentiate themselves. But I just wanted to show this example that you can use two different embedding models with your Weave 8 setup. It doesn't have to always be the same embedding model. So anyways, so here are some more resources on type predictors. It probably should be a little higher up, but just some more thoughts of, of uh, as we've been studying this idea of structuring outputs. In this case, we're going to be taking each code file and outputting a list of chunk with summaries where each object in the list has the chunk and a natural language summary of what's in the chunk. But also I really recommend this podcast with uh, Jason Liu. Uh, hilariously, uh, Alex from Ways and Bias has pointed out that Jason, Jason is the expert of JSON mode. Uh, he's created this instructor library and he's one of the thought leaders in structured output. So I really enjoyed this podcast and I'd probably recommend this resource over the others if you're interested. But so now what we're doing is we're looping through the files in our code. We're passing them into our chunker. We get out the chunk with summaries. And then we just loop through the chunk with summaries and we just import them into Weave8. So we do this for uh, the DSPy slash DSPy, DSPy slash DSP, and the documentation. So type predictors will fail. So type predictors, it just adds this JSON prompt to the language model call, and then it just validates it with the Pydantic schema, and it's going to try it three times. And if it fails all three times, then you fail. So that's the first big problem with generative feedback loops with structured outputs is we don't want it to ever fail and we need to have the infrastructure to catch the retries. So if we just use uh, the structured decoding approach, which is probably looks like that's what we're going to do, then we can integrate, say, with VLM and outlines to have the massive batch inference or we use the OpenAI API. But this has been one of the problems with this kind of idea broadly is that uh, enforcing JSON outputs with prompting requires a little bit of extra care to how you're going to validate and then retry but you could probably just trivially retry these failures so it still actually is a question of do we want to just have it run without the structured decoding which might be way faster and then just have a second kind of workflow that handles the retries and that also might be way faster so it's still i'd say it's still up in the air whether we're going to go structured decoding or uh you know, prompting and then retries and it, th this is something i think probably a lot of people building ai applications will hopefully find it interesting our experience on building this generative feedback loop thing into whatever they're building and hopefully <laughs> i hope it'll make you appreciate generative feedback loops more and how it can help you so the next thing is that i kind of want to highlight with this is the <laughs> is the rate limiting and this is going to be a killer to generative feedback loops that will you know we have so we're so we have to get around this rate limiting thing so we can't just uh, ping the OpenAI API uh, you know, all the time trying to get, get it to update uh, uh, 2,000 objects in five seconds. So we're going to need to look at different ways to achieve this, and that's a part of what we're trying to offer to you with our generative feedback loop service. So anyway, so in the end of this, we have we chunk up the, the files into 1,242 chunks in the code collection, 418 objects in the documentation collection. You can see how to hybrid search and Weaviate. So you're looking for the Weaviate RM, and now you can find the top result showing you how the Weaviate RM is implemented in the DSPy code and text summary of it. So now you see, hopefully, how to <laughs> import the code files and their summaries into Weaviate, and now you can search them and build whatever is next. Thank you so much for watching this video on semantic chunking with generative feedback loops. If you have any trouble following along with the code in the notebook, please feel free to open an issue in Weave Recipes and I will try my best to debug your problem. Uh, I really hope this inspired your interest and excitement about generative feedback loops, weaving together generative AI models and our database systems and feeding data from LLM calls 
or say a multimodal call, say generating images and saving these back into the database, then using content from the database to then provide as context for the next call to the generative model and this kind of weaving together as we update the objects in our database and create new objects in our database and all sorts of exciting things as we continue to explore generative feedback loops. Thank you so much for watching.